So my message would be to anyone watching this video or listening to this is that dreams are one of the few things that are free and no one can really control. So you should dream big. You should dream different. You should think different as Apple's slogan was. Even more than Jackie Chan, a lot of people think that I was uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Back in 1984 with Macintosh, I truly believe that the best product will win. You know, it just has to be the best product and everything else will fall into place. And Macintosh taught me that that's not true. I hope you'll point people to my podcast because there I truly do have remarkable people who, you know, I am nothing compared to. And my role there is to bring out their remarkableness so that people can access it. It's not about making me looking as a good personal brand as we discussed earlier. Hello dreamers, welcome to a new episode of Reflections with an Accent. Today I have the pleasure to introduce you to Guy Kawasaki. Kawasaki is known as the chief evangelist at Kamba, and in the 80s, he was part of the original Macintosh team. Something tells me that this man is pretty savvy on social media and marketing. Hello, Guy. It's so nice to have you in this, in this channel. It's been a while since I interviewed you for my column at the Geographic. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to uh, interact with you. Maybe not in person, but at least we're seeing each other. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's fantastic. So I would like to start with a very simple question. Yeah. Maybe it's not politically correct, but I think it's something that I have to ask you. How many times have you mistaken with Jackie Chan? <laughs> uh, many, <laughs> but even, even more than Jackie Chan, a lot of people think that I was uh, Robert Kiyosaki. That was my second question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what happens in that scenario, which is more common, is, and it's really a, kind of a setup, a funny setup, that someone will say, oh, you know, I was lost. I didn't know what to do with my life. And then I read your book and your book changed my life. And I'm thinking, which of my 15 books changed your life? Because, you know, yeah. there's more than one book you could be talking about. And they say, oh, rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, not another one. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad that my intuition worked well and we could start with a fun question. But now let's, <laughs> now that we broke the ice, let's start with the real interview. What is your dream? My dream? That's a complex question. So my dream for myself, my dream for my kids, or my dream for my country or the world? Which one do you want? So some of my questions, they tend to be very simple, but I present them in an open manner. Mm -hmm. So I give you complete freedom to address it in any way you want. Okay. Well, maybe I'll give you multiple answers then. Absolutely. So for myself, I have a very simple dream, which is, well, two. I have two simple dreams for myself. One is I want to be able to cross step and walk to the nose of my longboard. I'm talking surfing now. Yeah, I know. Second one is that I want more subscribers to my podcast. So that's, those are simple for me. For my family, I just want my kids and wife to have productive, meaningful, happy lives with good health. I mean, that's asking a lot. Um, so that's that. For the country, I want the preservation of democracy. I want uh, fair and equal treatment. I want it not to be you know, so dangerous for minorities. I want this kind of hate and denial of science to go away. Uh, you know, maybe America was never perfect, but it sure as hell is not on the right path right now. And so that's, you know, I think democracy is severely threatened in the United States right now. And then for the world and in general, I think the, the biggest crisis we all face is climate change. And if we don't take care of climate change, well, it doesn't matter if you don't have a democracy, right? So uh, we need to do both. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you for giving me such a well-rounded answer. What do you know now you wish you knew then? Oh, I should have never quit Apple twice. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that Apple would be a trillion dollar company. If I had known that, I would have stayed. And then, and then I wouldn't be on your podcast because uh, my personal assistant's personal assistant would have told you that Mr. Kawasaki is too busy to be on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to play a, a simple game with you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to tell you words and I want you to answer with the first thoughts emotions, memories that cross your mind. Okay. And I want you to elaborate slightly if, if you can. So the first word is going to be influence. Bullshit. <laughs> okay. So, the oh, but you want me to explain why? Yeah, 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 of course. If you can give me some background on, okay, on your well, answer, that would well, be when I, when I hear that word, it, it immediately parses to influencers. And then when I think of influencers, I think of people on TikTok and Instagram and, you know, how they're supposed to be so powerful and they tell you to buy this lipstick or buy this book or read, you know, read this book or listen to this podcast instantly with great credibility, everybody follows. And I think that that theory is just bullshit, that it's not that easy. I agree. Second word, mistakes. Learning. So I think that, you know, there's two ways to look at a quote unquote mistake. One is that it's a mistake. You know, you did something wrong, blah, blah, blah. The other way is that uh, it, uh, the value of a making a mistake is if you also learn something from making the mistake, because very few people go through life without making any mistakes. The question is, did you learn something after making the mistake? Hopefully enough to not make the same mistake. What if I say Hiroshima? Oh, you're asking a Japanese person? Of what course, you know, I, I, I've done my, my research, you know, you're talking yeah. a journalist here. Well, I mean, you know, Hiroshima equals atomic bomb. And for all the sort of belief that America is a peaceful nation, blah, blah, blah. Let's face it. We are the only country that dropped not one, but two atomic weapons on somebody. So maybe a little bit of hypocrisy there. What about if I refer to the word uh, patience? Patience? Um, that <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first reaction is none. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not a patient person. Uh, I have, I think that patience is an art form of hiding your impatience. Okay. You gave me the right answer because I read your quote. So that's what I was <laughs> hoping for. Uh, what if I say immigrant? Immigrant? I would say immigrant is the strength and backbone and source of the goodness and the value and the progress of America. I absolutely love that, that answer. What if I say 10, 20, 20? You mean 10, 20, 30? Or is this a test? Uh, yes. <laughs> 10, 20, 30 rule is 10 slides that you can give in 20 minutes with the smallest font being 30 points. So it's 10, 20, 30. Uh, curation. Curation? Curation is, that's what I do every day. Um, I think that the world is... You know, the functions are divided into basically two big camps. There's creation and there's curation. Creation, of course, meaning that you create video, text, whatever, music, content. You're creating it. Curation is the process of finding good content and sharing it. So you're not creating it. You're just finding it and sharing it. And that's what I do on social media. I am a curator as opposed to a creator. I don't create that much other than my podcast. And, you know, that is a big exception. In fact, the podcast takes so much effort that that limits my ability to create anything else except the podcast. Yeah, I believe you. It takes lots of effort, right? People, <laughs> people cannot even imagine. No, I mean, you know, for every hour of podcast, I probably put six or seven hours into it. Yeah, I believe you.
I believe you. So uh, two, two last questions for this brief game. NPR. NPR is my podcast. I tell people that my podcast is NPR without the pledge drive. So <laughs> NPR is this mythical, you know, gold standard that I wish to achieve or, or outdo. And the last, the last word that I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it properly. Mm -hmm. um, Lao wi li wi li nu ku nu ku oi oi. What? How do you spell it? I think it's the longest, uh, one of the longest words in Hawaii. That's, oh, that's, uh, well, you know, most people, when they want to pull up a Hawaiian word that sounds incomprehensible and is long, they say, hunu hunu nuku nuku apu a'a, which is the name of a fish. Okay. okay. So now you have two Hawaiian words in your vocabulary. So what are the, the, the five big lessons you've learned from Silicon Valley? Five? So big lesson number one is that your existing customer cannot tell you how to truly revolutionize a product. All they can tell you is how to make it better, you know, you know, marginally better, bigger, faster, cheaper. They can't tell you how to, if you're an Apple II customer, you cannot tell Apple how to create a Macintosh because it's just not in your frame of reference to describe something you've never seen before. That's number one. Number two is that, you know, A players, good employees will hire A players at a good as them or A plus players, even better than them. Whereas a B player who's an inferior employee will hire a C player so that the B player can feel superior to the C player. And then the C player will hire a D player and the D player will hire an E player. And pretty soon you have Z players. So you should always hire people who are equal or better to you. And the third thing is that when people believe in something, Um, forget about price and, you know, all the other kind of things that people want to put into a product mix. Uh, the most important thing is that people believe in it. And if they believe in it, they become your evangelists and they will carry the battle forward for you. Fantastic. What, what is a chief evangelist? Evangelism comes from the Greek word meaning bring the good news. So what an evangelist does is bring the good news. Uh, I brought the good news of Macintosh. It makes people more creative and productive. I'm currently bringing the good news of Canva, how it makes people better communicators because it has democratized design. So the chief evangelist is theoretically a position at a company where, you know, this person is supposed to be the most visible, I don't know about the best, but at least very good at bringing the good news of a product or a service. Okay, I actually have to confess that I'm a Canva user and, oh, and I good. love it. That's great. And, uh, and I was just wondering about some of the lessons you've learned from, from that role at Canva. Um, what, what can you share with us or, or with me that, that you didn't know before? Well, I don't know if I didn't know it before, but I think it's reinforced what I thought and hoped, which is, you know, with okay, just to back up for a second. So with Macintosh, 1984. I truly do believe, I, back in 1984 with Macintosh, I truly believe that the best product will win. You know, it just has to be the best product and everything else will fall into place. And Macintosh taught me that that's not true because Macintosh is and was better than MS-DOS and Apple II and Windows, but it did not win in terms of you know, the largest selling computer. So that was a lesson number one. Now, fast forward another 30 or 40 years, and now I'm involved with Canva. Canva has kind of been reassuring because Canva was the best product and it won. So hallelujah. So, <laughs> so the best product can win. It's, it may not be necessary or sufficient, but it can be done. Okay. So you're telling me basically that Canva is the best product out there, right? For, for, you know, of course, there is no best product for everybody. I mean, if, if you truly have to do something that's so high end, you need Photoshop. Okay. I understand that because there are things that Photoshop can do that Canva cannot. But I would say for 95% of the world, if you want to create a beautiful graphic as fast as possible, and if you want to deploy that in a presentation or a book cover or social media post or video, 
Canva is a better way to go. It simply I, is a better way And to I go. agree with you. I'm, I'm savvy with, you know, Lightroom, Photoshop, and I'm a Canva user, and I apply it for, for my Instagram and for all my social media accounts. So, yeah. That's I, great. Thank you. I, I hear you. Uh, what, are, what are some of, of the lessons? I was going to give you a number, but I'm going to make it more general. What do you learn from uh, Steve Jobs from that time in the in the early 80s, oh, right? If, well, what what do you learn from that interaction, that those two moments in time that you were well, linked to? In a sense, Apple? I've already answered that question because when you asked me what I learned from tech in Silicon Valley, those lessons I kind of learned from Steve Jobs. So okay. it's, you know, one and the same. Um, Steve but Jobs- But something, so, some, something in particular from, from the individual, from the interactions, from, from what you saw? Uh, well, in, I mean, in particular, Uh, so I learned those three lessons, right? About customers can't tell you how to create a revolution, but also, you know, specifically Steve Jobs, uh, I learned about the power of a demo, right? Because nobody mm -hmm. could demo stuff like Steve Jobs. And I saw how much power there is in a great demo, which is a very valuable lesson. More CEOs, frankly, should learn the power of a demo because their demos suck. So that's one. But I, you know, I also learned by watching him, um, He, he had his sort of mean streak, uh, impatience, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I observed that and don't get me wrong. He was a remarkable person. I don't think anybody has equaled him. Elon Musk may, but uh, I don't, I'm not convinced that it was necessary to be so harsh on some people. Mm -hmm. So I learned that too. Recently, I've been focused my attention on, on social media. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, doing some research on search engine optimization and, and trying to become more savvy on all these things. So uh, you refer to social media as being an art. Can you give me some points on how to conquer or master this art? You know, <laughs> I, I've been able to do it in the photo world in a way. But yeah. I feel social media, there's so many things out there, so much information. We're overwhelmed. Um, so I would like to hear your, your, your voice and your opinion well, regarding social media with practical stuff, right? Things that myself or anybody out there could actually incorporate into their daily existence when it comes with using social well, media. Well, first of all, let me tell you something. If, if you ask that question, and somebody professes that he or she knows the answer, that person is full of crap. I mean, okay. I think that social media is moving so fast that nobody truly knows. And um, so it, it, can become, it, can be, it can become overwhelming, to be honest, it, as, a, as a creator or even a curator. I, I, uh, I think you, say, you it takes, understate it takes that. Time. It, It's not that it can become over, uh, overwhelming. It is overwhelming. Okay. And so I think that, you know, the best path for social media is trial and error. And also second good path is copying people that are successful because nobody truly does know. And so, you know, I had a theory many years ago on Twitter that it's okay to repeat your tweets. So I would repeat the same tweet three or four times a day. And I read, many I read people that. told me, many people told me, you cannot do that. People will unfollow you. People are not going to want to see the same thing three times. My take was on, my take was that Twitter is so busy and so crowded that if you think that everybody who cares is paying attention at the moment you tweet, you're crazy. And, and like, It's just somebody, if you tweet something at 8 a.m., you think someone at 5 p.m. is going to go scrolling back and look for your tweets, you're on That's, drugs. Absolutely. So, you know, that was a piece of wisdom and insight that I had years ago. I don't know if it's still true. I think it is still true. But I guess I'm saying that, the, you know, the way to learn social media is experimentation and you know, copying people. And, you know, you copy people and that experiment may be wrong. So you don't do that. So... I wish I could tell you that this is exactly what to do. Well, no, I know. And, and, and do, do you think uh, in order to be successful, you need, you need to uh, exploit uh, the concept of, of a personal brand? Like in order to be successful, do you yeah. need to have your in own? In life, you mean? 
Yeah, both, both in life and social media, because in oh. a way, social media yeah. can be an extension well, of, of, of life. Uh, sure. not, not always, because people fake it and come up with this persona that they're not real. <laughs> but sure. let's say that a professional that has a real life and is using social media to project what yeah. they do, their persona. Well, what are uh, your thoughts? My thoughts are that quote unquote, this, this stated desire, this purposeful focused effort to build a personal brand is bullshit that, that your personal brand or for that matter, your product brand, it emerges from what people think, how they react, how good your product or service is. And so the concept that you're going to sit down and say, okay, so this is what I'm going to make my personal brand into. I think is bullshit. I think that, you know, you should focus on doing things well, making great products, making great services, and your personal brand will fall out of that. And I can tell you that I would very much doubt that Steve Jobs or Elon Musk ever sits down and says, Elon, what should your personal brand be? Like, how do you position yourself as a thought leader? I guarantee you, Steve Jobs did not sit around saying, how do I position myself as a thought leader? He just made great stuff. And then guess what? By making great stuff, people formed an impression of him that he's a visionary. Well, duh. So it's not because he said, I'm going to, you know, what should I position myself as? A great operator, a great manager, a visionary. I got all these choices. Ah, I think I'll pick visionary for product. He made great products and people figured out he's a visionary. That's how it works. So, you know, do whatever you do well and your personal brand will fall out of it. Going back to social media, I think that the same thing is true that, you know, do what you do well, do what you enjoy and the brand, you know, will fall out of it. But to, to engineer and try yes. to, you know, put lipstick on a pig, it's still a lipstick. Yes. To put lipstick on a pig, you still end up with a pig. With yes, lipstick. and uh, and it's a good point because I, I've seen it today in social media. People that they lack knowledge of particular industries or fields, yeah, and they start talking about different topics that they have no clue. <laughs> uh, and they read your books or other people's books, and they come up with bullet points and they give all these five ten minute speeches on things they have no clue what they're talking about. So I, I observe that too. It's quite interesting. Um, but it's a, it's a good point. So I, I, I can tell you that, you know, I can't say I spend zero time thinking about my personal brand, but the time that I spend thinking about my personal brand is defensive in the sense that I, I wonder, for example, you know, I'll take an extreme example. If the NRA sent me an email and said, guy, we're having the 2022 NRA meeting. Would you speak about innovation at that meeting? I would say no, because I think that would affect my personal brand to speak for the NRA or if a tobacco company uh, did that, or if, you know, a carbon based energy company, I would have second thoughts about that. So, so my thought about my personal brand is how do I keep my personal brand clean? I, I, another example is if a cannabis company asked me to speak, I would turn that down. So basically, you're 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 pretty much curating or restricting your own actions to make sure that the brand follows your uh, your beliefs, correct? Basically, yes. Okay. So um, I was I was doing some some research and reading. What do you think are the top mistakes of entrepreneurs these days? What, what, what are those mistakes yeah. that you see it over and over and over? Oh, I think yeah. you've been in, in, in the industry and in business from many sides. So you have an interesting uh, background to, to answer these well, questions. I, I, think sure. the, I think that the uh, common mistake, there's two. One is that entrepreneurs tend to hire people in their own self-image. So if you're an engineering male, you hire other engineering males. And what you need to do is get diversity. So if you're an engineering male, you probably should hire a female salesperson. Or if you're a if you're a female engineer, you need to hire a male, you know, 
straight, gay, you know, Muslim. I don't care, but something different from you. Uh, so don't hire in your whole self-image and, and, you know, don't have like a whole company full of clones. That's number one. Number two is that um, you should seek people who are devil's advocates, who will tell you when you have no clothes on. Many entrepreneurs are not capable of handling that, that they'd rather have people who just suck up to them and agree. And when you see that companies go particularly awry, especially morally and ethically, it's because everybody sucked up to the person and didn't tell that person you didn't have clothes on. And um, the third thing is that I've never seen a financial forecast be accurate. Like most startups, they predict cash flow a year too early and 10 times too high. So whenever somebody says, okay, so, you know, I'm profitable in year three and we're going to be doing 5 million. I, I hear that and I say, okay, so they're going to start shipping in year four and they're going to do best case two and a half million or maybe 500,000. But there, I've never seen a company achieve their initial forecast. Okay. Okay. And you know what, the, the problem with not achieving your initial forecast is because you're delusional and don't get me wrong, you have to be delusional to be an entrepreneur, but because you're delusional and you believe that in year three, you're going to be doing 5 million, you build the infrastructure to support your sales. And then guess what? Your software is late by year. And instead of being 5 million, it's 500,000. So you're totally upside down. You got all this infrastructure based on your delusional beliefs and optimism. And now, you know, you have all this expense infrastructure and stuff that you cannot support. And then you go through this whole gyration of, well, but these are such valuable people. I've invested in them so much. We'll just keep them on another year because that's when the miracle will occur. The miracle never occurs. Great, great answer. And I want to change the, the topic a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've seen that uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're yeah. going up going up again. Yeah. And I was wondering what is uh, Guy Kawasaki's position on all this cryptocurrency world, I, Bitcoin, okay. blockchain, if, if you want to talk sure. about it or, sure. or sure, if it's sure, a topic sure. that is not of your so, interest, you know, then uh, I'll you know, it. In my, in my speeches, in my book, one of the last points I have is, you know, don't let the, the bozos grind you down. And the way I illustrate this is I pull up quotes of very famous, powerful people, very successful people who were absolutely dead wrong about something, right? So Thomas Watson of IBM says there's only going to be five computers in the world, or uh, Western Union says that telephones will fail, or Ken Olson, founder of Dex, says that no one wants a personal computer. Okay, so I absolutely absolutely understand that. And I'm going to take the risk right now of telling you that I think that cyber currency like that is pure smoke and mirrors. It's like buying tulips because everybody else is buying tulips. And I, I just don't see, I mean, you know, I mean, if somebody said to you, okay, so this is going to be a secret currency and this is mysterious person. We think he's Japanese who has made this thing very hard to quote unquote mine. And there's only going to be 21 million of it. And it's going to use this structure so that no country can control its, the currency. And it's going to freely float in value. Why don't you invest in it? I'm like, <laughs> I mean, and then, <laughs> and then if you say to me, okay, so guy, you know what? Um, your speech is X thousands of dollars. We're going to pay you in Bitcoin. Well, you know, in my life, I take so many risks. I take risks with my investment. I take risks surfing. I take risks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things I don't want to take a risk with is the value of the currency. So if you pay me for a speech on Monday, on Tuesday, I would like it to be still about the same amount of money. Now, I admit with Bitcoin, on Tuesday, maybe I just got twice as much as Monday. <laughs> but it's also possible that on Tuesday, it's worth half as much. And yeah. so I don't choose to put a lot of um, risk on the currency because there's other risks. What if the event cancels? What if I bomb? What if I'm sick and can't make the speech? You know, whatever. There's like a lot of risk. Currency is not one of the risks I want to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just... 
I don't understand. And, you know, the, most of the people who are evangelists for currency like this are totally conflicted. Now, don't get me wrong. When I was a Macintosh evangelist, I was conflicted too. But, you know, if you ask yourself, when you talk to this so-called expert and they say, yeah, you know, invest in Bitcoin because it's going to go from 100,000 to a million. Is that wishful thinking? Is that they're trying to... Um, they're trying to make something happen because they have Bitcoin. I mean, you know, what, what is somebody, I wish somebody could explain to me the fundamental economic real value of Bitcoin. And the answer cannot be, well, you should invest in it because it's going to go up. That's not what I'm asking. Like, why does it exist? And I haven't heard a good answer to that yet. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for being so honest because I've been thinking about the same topic. I'm not going to, disclose my, my my opinion but I'm, yeah. I'm 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 torn between two two thoughts um but uh, hey, but like i said you know someone may pull up this podcast 20 years from now and say you see guy guy was he was so smart about macintosh and canva what a dumbass about bitcoin bitcoin today is five billion dollars you know per coin and if he wasn't such a dumbass he would have bought a, a few coins at a hundred thousand dollars and you know but he's so stupid. So I well, freely true, admit that know. could happen. It's it's a topic that is yeah, it's hard to avoid. But you you have to admit. On the other hand, it could be a year from now we're saying, oh, all those dumbasses. They bought Bitcoin at a hundred thousand and it went to zero, and you know, it it's disappeared. That could happen too. That could happen too. I agree. <laughs> I, <laughs> I agree Who with knows? you. Who knows? That's true. And uh, so we have a tradition in, in this channel and all our yep. guests take my, my saying, I always close my videos with never stop dreaming. And they take it, they transform it into their own words and they invite my viewers, now your viewers too, to yeah. dream. What would be your message to anyone that will be watching, um, that will be watching this video? So my message would be to anyone watching this video, or listening to this is that dreams are one of the few things that are free and no one can really control so you should dream big you should dream different you should think different as apple's slogan was and I wish I could promise you that just because you dreamed it, it's possible. That's not true. That would be misleading you. But if you don't dream it and you don't try, you'll never know. And so that is almost as bad as not being able to realize your dream. So fantastic. Fantastic. There you go. So it's it's been really fun sharing with you. I, I always admire your versatility and skills and, and chatting with you was really inspiring. But above all, it was nice to to get to know you a little bit better, you know, I've been reading what you do and you yeah, see people you. on social media. So seeing each other face to face, it was it was a treat to me. All right. Thank you. And not success. If you think I've added value to the world with my writing and speaking. Yes. It, as I look back on my career, my podcast is the best work I have ever done. So if you think any of my books are good, I'm telling you, my podcast is better than my best books. I will, I will, the idea of, of, of providing value uh, to, to the viewers, I think that's the key of social media, as, as you referred before. Yes. I, think that's the, I think that is the secret. Okay, so um, your homework is to go listen to the episode of Tim Ferriss on Remarkable People. Okay. I have I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're pretty good connected, so I'm sure you'll have good... Uh, you, I, you'll have good you should listen to Tim Ferriss, Gary V. And I, Justine, all three of them are on my podcast. And yesterday or two days ago, I interviewed Seth Godin. 